never forget that the way to judge any society, any group of human beings, is not against some impossible ideal standard. You must judge people against where they've come from, the efforts they've made to improve themselves, and what the alternatives are. By any of those measures, Canada is a rare jewel in human experience. We have every reason to be proud of Canada. Canada is an extraordinary country with a proud history and a promising future. But our peaceful, pluralistic, free society did not pop up overnight. It was built and preserved by past generations of Canadians and British North Americans who understood the importance of the rule of law, tradition, liberty, and of course, peace, order, and good governance. We cannot divorce our successful present society from our rich historical past. That is why we must reject and combat modern efforts to erase our history, tear down statues, rename streets and schools, and paint one-dimensional caricatures demonizing historical figures and past events. My guest on today's special Dominion Day episode of the True North Speaker series is Dr. Brian Lee Crowley, Canada's foremost public intellectual and scholar on Canadian history and public policy. Brian is the managing director of the Macdonald Laurie Institute, Ottawa's most important think tank. He's a frequent contributor and former editorial member of the Globe and Mail and the author of several books, including The Canadian Century, Moving Out of America's Shadow, and my personal favorite, Fearful Symmetry, The Fall and Rise of Canada's Founding Values. Brian is a patriotic Canadian who has a deep understanding of what makes Canada great, why we should celebrate our history, including our first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, and how we can recognize past injustices, have meaningful reconciliation with First Nations peoples, and all the while remain proud, strong, vigilant, and patriotic Canadians. In our conversation today, Brian and I discuss what makes Canada so unique and so great, the many accomplishments of Sir John A. Macdonald, reasons to celebrate our history and early leaders, and the building of the Canadian ideal, where rights, freedom, dignity, and justice are extended and protected for each and every one of us. Understanding where we came from and the importance of our achievements is the best antidote to the fervent anti-Canadian mob. Well, first, Brian, happy Canada Day or happy Dominion Day. I don't know which one we're calling it these days, but uh, thank you so much for joining True North Speaker Series. We're really excited to have you on the show today. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Canada Day or Dominion Day, I use both, uh, is a terribly important day in the life of Canada. Well, thank you. I mean, it sort of falls at an interesting time because the last month or so have been dominated with really hard conversations looking at Canada's past and history and, and, and sort of re-examining some of the sort of defining moments of our country, you sort of see people trying to paint it in a very negative light. And I think a lot of Canadians, you know, we always want to strive to do better. We, we, we believe in our country, we love our country, uh, but, but it's definitely a tough cultural moment at the time. So f from your perspective, Brian, what, what, what is there to celebrate? What do you celebrate on Canada Day and what do we have to, to celebrate on this holiday? Well, you know, Candace, I, I sometimes think that um, the people who really understand uh, how great Canada is, are actually not the people born here. The people who understand how great Canada is are the people who have chosen to come here. Uh, the many immigrants, for example, who uh, have come and settled in Canada. And I had the privilege just, uh, just the other day to speak to uh, a, you know, a similar kind of conversation uh, at the um, Canada India Foundation. And, um, you know, the audience was primarily people who come to Canada from India over the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years. And um, I said to them that I, 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 I thought they were terribly important uh, in the Canadian mosaic and in the, in the Canadian society uh, because they understand better than people born in Canada that Canada is, in fact, not a vicious, evil, racist uh, society that should hang its head in shame. It is a place where if we open the doors tomorrow, as a politician I once heard say, if we open the doors tomorrow, this place would look like Walmart on a Saturday morning because people would 
rush into Canada from all over the world. And I, I think we have to take a minute to think about why is that? I mean, if you think about uh, my ancestors who came to Canada, I'm a fifth generation Canadian, but you know, my, my ancestors on my father's side, Lawrence and Honora Crowley came to Canada from Ireland uh, in the 1820s. And um, they didn't come for multiculturalism. They didn't come for free visits to the doctor's office. You know, all the things that people today tend to say, oh, these are the great things about Canada. There's nothing wrong with those things. Don't get me wrong. But they didn't come for those things because they didn't exist. And yet millions of people came to Canada. Millions of people came to Canada. And they came, I think, because Canada was a place where they knew, but they, they didn't know how they were gonna earn their living. They didn't know whether they were gonna succeed. But what they did know was that they would be given the chance to succeed. And often the places that they come from will never give people like them a chance to succeed. Uh, and when they are given a chance to succeed and they can devote their energies to making success to themselves in Canada, they know that no one will step in and steal what they have done, whether it's other people or the state or generals or, you know, ministers or nobody gets to take what you have created other than through taxation that's applied fairly to everybody. So, you know, people know that Canada is a place where you're given your chance. And I, 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 I think the many people who've come to Canada, and, uh, you know, my local MP, his wife uh, came here from uh, Latin America, I think. And she was tweeting just the other day, you know, Canada has given my family everything, everything. And, and that's what she means. She, she, she means that Canada has given my family a chance, a chance to make of itself what it has the ability to make of itself. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are many, many societies in the world where your place is determined before you take your first breath because, you know, of your social class or your party membership or your caste or whatever it is. In Canada, it's not like that for the vast majority of people. Are there people who, you know, get stuck, you know, you know who face prejudice, uh, I, I, think about uh, indigenous people. I, I think the position of indi indigenous people in Canada is, a, is, is scandalous and uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't accept it and we need to work hard to fix it. And that's one of the things that this generation, I think, uh, has got some responsibility to do. But when you think about all the people in Canada and the opportunity that Canada offers to them to create a life that is in keeping with what they want for themselves, this is a rare jewel in human experience, and it's what makes Canada great. Well, that's a, that's a beautiful explanation, Brian, and I, I can sort of attest to that. My, my family, like yours, has been in Canada for many generations, as, as far as nine generations back, and then on other sides of the family, you know, I'm the second generation. My grandfather was born in England, um, but my husband was born in Iran, and his family moved to Canada when he was 13 years old, and he, he is probably the most patriotic Canadian I know. I mean, I grew up loving Canada and being very proud of Canada and, and, and loving my country, but I feel like his, his patriotism is on a different level because he really, he really believes that if he had stayed in Iran, he'd probably be in jail or he would have been killed by the government already. So even having that opportunity and getting to live through that and you, you kind of see th through, through, through someone like that's experience, wow, Canada is pretty great with all of its, um, you know, with all, all, the, all the past things that have happened all the history, there's still something really positive. Well, can, can we kind of unpack that a little bit? Because, you know, it, what, what makes Canada great? How, how is it the case that we've built the society or the society's been built that, that doesn't have all of those barriers that so many other countries do? I mean, I mean, some people will just say, you know, Canada was sort of blessed with natural resources and, and a new frontier. And because of that, uh, we were able to have this free society. But as you and I both know, free societies don't just sort of pop up. They, they require, you know, the institutions and the rules and the foundation um, to build that. So, so, so how is it that Canada became uh, this, this wonderful place that you and I call home? Well, you see, I think there's many, many tributaries 
that flow into Canada uh, and that make it the great place that it is. So let, let, let's pick a few because uh, we can't talk about everything. Um, I think one of the things that um, has blessed Canada is the fact that we're, we're, in, we're what I call a new world society. You know, we're not one of these places in which, you know, a, an ancient culture, a long history, uh, a, a class structure, all these things have sort of created a society in which everybody's place is fixed. Um, we created uh, something new in, in North America when we came here. And so the New World Societies, places like America, Canada, Australia, um, these are places that escaped some of the dead hand of history that uh, has oppressed so many people in uh, older societies. So I think, th I think that's number one. Number two, um, I would uh, point out the, the, the tradition of freedom that came with the, uh, the original uh, settlers from uh, British society. We are the inheritors, and, uh, and this is not limited to English speakers in Canada. French speakers benefit just as much as English speakers, but uh, there is a long tradition of freedom in Britain, going back to the Magna Carta and even beyond, uh, which we are the inheritors of. Uh, and, you know, when people look at Canadian society and they see the flaws, they look back in our history and they say, well, you know, you know uh, gee, in earlier generations, we didn't treat uh, uh, blacks or indigenous people or, or women or whatever as well as we do today. Uh, 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 of course, this is true. What they forget is that the fact that we treat minorities and uh, you know oppressed groups and people trying to immigrate to Canada from uh, non-traditional countries etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, the, the reason that we do that better now is because we have a long tradition of trying to work out our problems trying to understand what the principles are that uh, kind of underlie our tradition of freedom and asking ourselves where are we falling down and applying that tradition? Where are we not giving people the benefit of this tradition of freedom, uh, which um, maybe uh, you know people like you and me uh, are used to having, but people who are newly arrived, you know, we all remember the Koma Gadamaru, people trying to get into Canada from India at the early part of the 20th century, or you know, lots of other incidents. Uh, of uh, Canada failing to live up to its high standards of how to treat people. And what, what I always try and tell people is, you know, th the issue isn't, did we make mistakes? Did we fail to, to extend to women and minorities and so on, uh, many of the benefits of our institutions? Yeah, of course we did. The issue is never, did we make mistakes? It, it's, it's, it's just the other way around. There's nobody in the world who hasn't made mistakes. The issue is always, how did you deal with your mistakes? How did you deal with the fact that some people said, you know what, you're not treating me fairly. I'm not getting the benefit of the institutions of freedom and so on that, that you keep saying is what makes Canada great. And we take those criticisms seriously. We think about how have we failed? How could we do better? And the fact that young people, for example, today can look back at Canadian history and say, oh my God, we did bad things in the past. No, no one disputes that we did bad things in the past, but they forget to add the other part, which is that we looked at both the, the things we aspire to, the ideals that we had, and the actual treatment of people. And we said, hmm, sometimes we're not getting this right. And we changed and we, we improved our institutions. We tried, we extended, you know, the circle of immigration. It used to be that we let white people into, into Canada. That's not the case anymore. As it's not the case, not because somebody swooped in and forced us to, against our will, to do something we didn't want to do. It was because we said, hmm, you know, we as a society have always said that we wanted to treat each other 
respectfully. We wanted to have freedom for everybody who came to Canada. We, we didn't want to have racial prejudice. And sometimes we've, we've fallen down on that. How are we going to fix that? And I think the Canada that we all celebrate now is not uh, the, uh, the way some people want to represent it as the inheritor of a terrible, evil, vicious tradition of racism and sexism and homophobia. We are a society that has spent a lot of its time and effort over the years trying to think about how to do better. And I dare say that if you compare Canada to just about any other society in the world, we have made more progress on these fronts than anybody else I can think of. Well, it's hard to think of another, even a new world country uh, that doesn't have some of the same sort of horrific uh, past. Uh, you know, I traveled down in Latin America and, and spent a bit of time in Argentina and Brazil. And, you, you know, you look at the way that, that the Spanish treated some of the indigenous people. And, and, you know, not to say that Canada didn't as well, but, but there's sort of different scales in terms of, of the atrocities that were carried out. Well, Brian, you seem to describe Canada as sort of like a positive altruistic foundation that, that had some flaws that, that we're constantly working to, to improve and, and to, to, to kind of expand that ideal to everyone. But some of the critics and some of the people who sort of pioneer the new cancel culture and trying to erase our history, they'll make the opposite claim that the foundation itself is rotten and, and, and that those, you know, those flaws that you that pointed out are actually the foundation so that we can't really move forward unless we start dismantling, uh, you know, institutions and foundations that they say were, were founded on these, on these flawed ideas. H how do you, how do you combat that? How do you counter that? How can we preserve our traditions and our, and our institutions when we know that there were bad things that happened and, and, and sort of how do we combat those radical voices that are demanding that we tear things down? Yeah, well, you see, I, I think when you, when you look at a society like Canada or, or the United States, you know, another society founded on these great traditions of uh, freedom, what we have to understand is that there, there is no such thing as, uh, as human beings without prejudices, without self-interest, without all these things. And that, by the way, includes the current generation you know, the next generation and the one after that will look back on them and say, wow, they weren't as enlightened as we are. I, I, th this idea that somehow this current generation is uniquely able to look back and see all the flaws that happened before, but they're perfectly enlightened and have no blind spots is nonsense. Every human being has blind spots. You know, the issue is, it seems to me, uh, the, uh, back to this idea that no, there's no, no such thing as a human being who doesn't make mistakes. No such thing as a society who doesn't make mistakes. How you judge uh, individuals in society is not on their mistakes. It's on how they dealt with the mistakes. Did they step up? Did they take ownership of their mistakes? Did they accept responsibility? Did they try to fix it? Uh, and I think that the history of Canada, uh, and, and as I said uh, before, you know, the history of Canada uh, doesn't start in Canada. It's a history that reaches way back. Take something like the Magna Carta. You know, the Magna Carta, uh, you know, people will say, well, Magna Carta involved just a bunch of uh, barons kind of negotiating with the king uh, over whether the king could do whatever he wanted or the king needed to consult a few, you know, this handful of aristocrats. And in a way, that's true. I mean, the Magna Carta wasn't about the average person. It wasn't about guaranteeing rights to people like you and me. Uh, it didn't uh, end serfdom, and it uh, you know it didn't end the feudal. So, in, in a way, it's 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 a bad thing. It confirmed uh, you know the 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 status of, uh, of of a handful of people running society. But what people forget is that it kicked off a process. It kicked off a process. Okay, it started with the, you know, a few barons getting a little more power vis-a-vis -vis the king. But it started off a process in which we had to keep enlarging at every stage the circle of people who were drawn into decision making. And ultimately, we got to the point where we were debating whether, well, shouldn't everyone have a, have a role? You know, we went from you know, the Reform Acts of the 1830s where, you know, just a handful of people now were 
were voting in elections and so on until we got to the 20th century and suddenly women were voting and people who didn't have property were voting. And, you know, we got to a point where everyone had to be consulted about how power was going to be exercised. But Magna Carta was necessary to kick that off, to, to, to establish the idea that the king didn't just get to do whatever he wanted. Uh, and um, you might look back and say at every stage, well, you know, when we extended the franchise to a handful of people, we didn't extend it to everybody. And therefore, that's, that, that's evidence of how vicious society is. Well, that's not the way I see it. I look back at those same facts and I see, I see the unfolding of a process in which we took seriously the ideas of freedom and individual dignity and responsibility. And we, we progressively extended it and extended it and extended it till we reached today. And, you know, we're having further debates today. Well, are, are there still people who don't get the full recognition of their individual dignity, who don't get recognition of their full freedom? That's a perfectly legitimate conversation to have. It doesn't require us to despise our past to have that conversation. On the contrary, it is the unfolding of the ideas that underpin our society throughout history that is the foundation stone of the individual rights and things that we so value today. We, we can't actually have the benefits that we want today and dispense with how we got them. The process is actually essential and it, it, the, the process is what's woven into our institution. And it's, it's the, the process has not, it, we have to think about the, the direction of the process. The direction of the process has been in the right direction. We have com consistently moved to improve the functioning of our institutions in order to bring them more in accordance with these universal ideas of freedom and dignity, which um, I think underlie Canada's success. That's interesting. I've, I've heard the argument that, you know, not just Canada, but the Western world has sort of reached that peak liberalism where, where you know, we've achieved... The, the sort of maximum amount of liberty extended to the maximum amount of people and that we can sort of only go down from here. And you, you hear it on the left, sort of the idea of like late stage capitalism, uh, things are starting to fall apart. You, you hear it a little bit on the right as well. Jonah Goldberg's uh, latest book about the, the collapse of America, um, it, where, where he basically argues that we're at the top of the mountain and no matter which direction we go, we're going down from here. What, what, what do you say to those uh, people? Are you, are you sort of pessimistic about this or do you think that there's still a room where we can go maintaining our sort of ordered liberty and our traditions that date back to the Magna Carta, as you mentioned? Uh, or, or do you think that th there's a point where you just start sort of nowhere left to go but down? Well, look, my view is that no human achievement is permanent. Uh, they're always vulnerable. Uh, and that includes the freedom uh, and, you know, well-functioning institutions that are, I think, the, the blessing that Canada bestows upon us. Um, so, you know, we can't afford to be complacent. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that concerns me about, you know, all the unfolding demonstrations and the tearing down of statues and the rejection, rejection of, uh, of our history and so on, one of the things that concerns me about that is that I, I, I feel that uh, people are trying to rip out by the roots uh, uh, the, the, the plant whose fruits they, they, they so desperately want. Uh, your question is, will they succeed? Uh, I, I, I don't think they will succeed this time. Um, I can't speak for the future and future circumstances. I know nothing about uh, what I think is that, uh, there is a minority of people who have misunderstood what Canada is and where Canada came from. And they, in, I, I'm sorry to use such a strong word in their ignorance, uh, they are out agitating for the destruction of what has made Canada a society worth having. 
I don't believe that this attitude is shared by the average Canadian. Uh, it, 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 and I, I think that what is in the hearts of people uh, will, will prevail. And uh, as long as Canadians in their heart of hearts think that, you know, Canada is, it's not that Canada is a perfect society, but we must always compare it with where we came from and what the alternatives are. And uh, in both cases, I think uh, uh, Canadians are of the view that Canada is pretty darn good. Uh, and that this is the reason why so many people flock to Canada. Uh, we have one of the highest uh, ratios of people born in another country of any society in the world. Uh, and I don't think people will give this up lightly. Uh, now, Canadians being a rather self-effaced lot, uh, uh, you know, don't, unlike, say, Americans, they don't get out in the street and say, okay, you're demonstrating uh, for something I don't believe in and I'm going to push back. Canadians, you know, kind of say, well, okay, well, let them have their say, you know. Uh, but uh, I don't think that you will find that ordinary Canadians will lend their, uh, their energies and their, their endorsement uh, to a tearing down of a society that I think they feel quite warmly about. So, well, you mentioned that a lot of it comes from sort of just misunderstanding or an ignorance of history. Maybe we can try to get through some of that history to understand where Canada came from. We talked about the Magna Carta as sort of being the origin of a constitution, but here in Canada, you know, the, the, the idea of Canada, you can't really divorce it from the architect, which was you know, Sir John A. Macdonald, who who led led the discussions and and was the our country's first prime minister? Now you've you've been a defender and admirer of Sir John A. And in recent years, he's obviously become a, a target of of criticism. Um, so before we get into some of the controversy, let's let's talk a little bit about Sir John A. Macdonald's legacy um, and what he did for Canada and, and why uh, why we should be proud. Sure. Well, um, you know, I've, uh, as you say, I've talked about how. Canada and its great traditions reach all the way back to Magna Carta and beyond. But, you know, the, 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 the most important uh, manifestations of that tradition from Canada's point of view were things like 1867. This is what we celebrate on Canada Day or, or on Dominion Day. We celebrate uh, the founding of a political order. Now, you know, it, don't get me wrong. 1867 didn't create Canada what we are as a society predates uh, 1867. Uh, its roots go way back beyond that. But what 1867 did was it created a political order to, to frame that in the northern half of North America. And uh, Sir John A. was not the only guy, but he was the top guy. He was the one whose vision allowed us to bring together these disparate colonies who were often at loggerheads with each other. They mistrusted each other. There were customs booths at the border between these, uh, between these colonies. Um, uh, there, there was division between English speakers and French speakers, between Catholics and Protestants. Um, it was not at all evident that it would be possible to get them to agree to create a political society in which they would work together uh, on things uh, of common interest. Uh, it was Sir John A's vision about how we could create such a political society in North America, you know, this transcontinental parliamentary democracy uh, under a, you know, monarchical head of state, uh, we are really probably the third or fourth oldest functioning political order in the world. There are lots of other older societies, but their political structure has not succeeded and, and not endured as long as Canada's has. Uh, and, you know, Sir John A. was 
lived at a time of great nation building. You know, the, this, was the, this was the era when Germany was created out of a bunch of tiny little princely statelets, uh, when Italy was created uh, as, a, as a modern nation state, again, out of a bunch of tiny little statelets. Uh, other, other countries uh, also emerged uh, as fully fledged nation states. Canada, under Sir John A. Macdonald's leadership, is one of those states that emerged out of division and confusion and so on um, at, at exactly that time. And uh, I think that we owe Sir John A. a tremendous debt of gratitude for having enabled us to reach this uh, political order, which has proven so durable, in the face of all the conflicts that I mentioned, without any use of force, this was all something um, that was discussed and negotiated and agreed to. Um, I think that uh, for Canadians to do anything but recognize the greatness of Sir Johnny's vision and his incredible political skills, bringing it to fruition, right? for, for us to do anything but to celebrate that man would be a travesty. It's interesting because uh, our neighbors down south in the U.S. they 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 learn so much about the founding fathers. They study the the Federalist Papers and and they they learn in so much detail about the the sort of deliberations that went on in in, in the Revolutionary War and everything that that led to the sort of Independence Day. We we don't really learn as much about the sort of origin of, of Canada. I, I, I learned something that I didn't know before from watching one of your videos, which was that Sir Johnny MacDonald had read and studied these U.S. founding fathers, and he actually brought a copy of the Federalist Papers to the Confederation table. Um, and so he, he, he focused and, 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 and tried to learn from the mistakes that he saw that had been made um, by those founding fathers in the U.S. and, and tried to create a, something slightly different to, to sort of ensure that Canada didn't go down that path. Maybe you could speak a little bit to, to that and what, what, what his vision really was and how it differed from that of the founding fathers. Yeah, well, of course, um, you have to remember that uh, I, I, I talked a little bit about uh, the era of the creation of Canada being one of great nation building. Uh, but it, it was also the, the, the years immediately following the American Civil War. Uh, you know, the Great Republic to the South had literally torn itself apart. By the way, uh, it tore itself apart over a disagreement about how to it extend the benefits of, you know, the American political order to people who were wrongly excluded uh, in 1776 and, and later when they, uh, when they actually created the, uh, the, the American Constitution. Uh, we're talking, of course, about slaves. Um, the Civil War was all about slavery, states' rights, uh, you know, the ability of uh, the southern states to maintain slavery in the face of the opposition of the North. Uh, but it was also, a, it was a battle over values. It was a battle over, um, is America right to allow this exception to you know the, the the liberal individualism that underlies uh, American society is it right to allow this exception? The the conclusion from American Civil War was it, it it was not acceptable to allow this exception. Uh, but back to Canada, um, you know, Sir John A. saw uh, uh, an, an American society which they uh, he and his uh, uh, fellow founders of Canada they saw a society in which they thought the chief problem was that the individual units, you know, the states were too powerful and Washington was too weak. Uh, and they set out expressly to create uh, a, a Canada in which uh, there would be a powerful central government buttressed by important powers granted under the constitution. Uh, and that this would create a society that would um, buttress and protect peace, order, and good government. Um, now, you know, one of these great ironies of history, um, Canada didn't quite unfold exactly that way. And uh, because of judicial decisions and, uh, you know, the, the English-French division uh, and lots of other reasons, 
can it end up being quite decentralized? But it was, it was part of the genius of what Sir John A. and uh, his colleagues created, that it had, the, it had the strength and the flexibility to adjust over time. Uh, and, um, you know, Sir John A. thought uh, that one of the great weaknesses of the American um, experiment was that uh, it was a kind of unrestricted uh, democracy that, uh, you know, the mob could kind of get a hold of political institutions and rule and be, and be driven by emotion and so on. And um, Sir John A. said, well, that's, that's, that's not really our tradition. Our tradition is of a, a, a strong government that uh, protects individual rights. And, you know, one of the things that uh, Sir John A. famously said was, if, if, if a man has rights, I will protect them till my dying day. Uh, uh, and uh, he thought that, and, and this is part of the, that British tradition that we talked about, that um, if individuals are to succeed, we can't give the mob, which is uh, you know, a, a bunch of individuals driven by emotion, we can't give them too much power. We have to have a, we have to have a strong state, uh, but one that doesn't interfere too much. It doesn't get in the way of people pursuing their own, uh, their own objectives, their own vision of the good life. Uh, and I think he struck a pretty good balance there. And certainly he was happy uh, with the balance that he struck and thought it was a better one than the Americans had found. It's interesting because I, I debate with some of my sort of libertarian friends down in the States and we compare the two systems a lot. And, you know, in some ways, Canada is not nearly as free as the United States, particularly, you know, with health care and things like that. Uh, but then on another on other uh, issues like, you know, one of the one of the issues a lot of my friends have in the U.S. is lack of school choice and the fact that they have this federal Department of Education uh, that makes decisions about local schools, you know, from from a centralized position in Washington, where Canada doesn't have that, and we have a lot more school choice. So I think you can definitely look at the the sort of outcome and and, and see in ways in which both countries are freer. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you about, though, is that there seems to be more so than in the U.S. There seems to be movements towards um, separatism and and you know provinces leaving the country. You hear about it a lot more in Canada than you do in the U.S. with secession movements down there. So you know you, you have the, the history now of Quebec separatism. There seems to be a new flaring one out west with with Alberta or Wexit. Uh, what, what, do you think that's something that's that's sort of baked into the the, the framework that Sir John A. created, or is that just uh, uh, you know uh, it's something that was bound to happen just given the different types of people that that moved and settled in those areas? Yes, well, I I, I remember very well when I was uh, when I was younger, and uh, the, I think it was the first Quebec referendum was uh, underway. So that would have been about 1980. Uh, and uh, I was talking to an American and, uh, you know, for some reason this, this came up. And uh, this guy said, but how can, you have a, how can you have a referendum on separation? We settled that question in the Civil War. Uh, well, you know, the Americans settled it. The Americans settled the question. They, they, they had a far more successful uh, secessionist movement in Canada, in uh, the United States, than we've ever had in Canada. They they had thirteen states that declared independence from Washington. Uh, they had their own president, Jefferson Davis. I've, I've I've been to the house where he lived in retirement after the failure of the secessionist experiment. Um, uh, but uh, they fought a bloody civil war uh, over it, and the conclusion from that civil war was: okay, we're not going to try that again. Uh, I, I, I think uh, Americans have it very firmly anchored in their minds that you don't play the separatist card. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, and uh, whatever uh, unhappiness, divisions, arguments, cleavages, however you like to think of it, uh, uh, arise, we're going to work them out within the political system. Now. Canada uh, has a different experience. Uh, 
Um, we've never had a successful uh, secessionist movement. Uh, we have had um, uh, votes uh, in favor of secession. You, you, you might know that in Nova Scotia, right after 1867, there was actually a vote to, they said, we don't want this, yeah, let's get out of here. Uh, it was not successful. Uh, but um, basically we have allowed that idea to take root in Canada that really if you don't like things here, it, you're entitled to take your marbles and go home. And um, I, I, I'm sorry to say that the, uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, uh, endorsed that idea. Um, I, I think it would been completely open to the Supreme Court to say, we can find nothing in the Constitution about leaving and said, you know, if you, if you want to leave, you're, you're going to have to amend the Constitution to, to, to make that possibility real. Uh, they didn't say that. I think that's too bad. Uh, but what they did say was, uh, and, and this is completely correct in my view, um, uh, if there's going to be discussion of leaving, let's be very clear that it must be done in accordance with the rule of law. In other words, uh, if you have a vote in any province, Alberta, Quebec, British Columbia, you name it, uh, if you have a vote to leave, that doesn't settle the question. That just says, okay, um, we, we want to leave. What do you have to say? And that there has to be a negotiation and there has to be, it has to be done in accordance with the law and that would require amendment to the constitution and all these complicated, difficult things. Uh, that, was the, that was the correct thing for the Supreme Court to say. Uh, and so um, I, I have to say that I, I, I think that... Uh, well, I, I, in a way, I wish the Supreme Court had said, the Constitution says nothing about being able to leave, so unless you change the Constitution, it's off the table. Um, but what they, what they did say was, whatever you do, it must be done in accordance with the rule of law. And that's a great Canadian tradition. Uh, and that makes uh, leaving, while you can threaten it, you know, we can stop you from saying, I want to leave. Uh, while you can threaten it, actually doing it is incredibly hard. Uh, and so uh, I actually think that the power of threatening to leave is much reduced compared to what it was, let's say, in 1980 when the first uh, referendum was held on sovereignty association and people thought, gee, uh, a lot of people thought if Quebec votes yes, that's the end of the country. Now we know that um, even, uh, you know, a big important province like Quebec voting to leave, that is not the end of the discussion. That's the beginning. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we, we talk a lot about in Canada, and you hear from all the political parties, is, is what, what you were just mentioning, the sort of foundation of the rule of law. We, we, we hear it from, from all politicians, but it's never, it's not often usually dissected and explained. And so if, if you can tie it back to Sir John A.'s legacy, how, how, would, how would you describe the rule of law? What does it mean in Canada, and, and how is that part of Sir John A.'s legacy? Mm. Well, yeah, the rule of law is absolutely central. Uh, in fact, I, I would put the rule of law on an equal footing with democracy. Uh, if, if, if you said to me, would you rather live in a society that's democratic, but doesn't have the rule of law, or a society that has the rule of law, but is not democratic, I choose the rule of law society. I want both, don't get, don't get me wrong. Uh, I, I want both, but actually, the rule of law is absolutely the foundation stone of all the rest. So um, the, the rule of law uh, es essentially says that um, true law, true law is founded on the idea that um, a, a, a law is only justified, a law is only real, a law is only authorized, a law is only uh, justified if it applies to everybody uh, and applies to everybody equally, that there is no one exempted from the rule of law, that there are no exceptions from the law, uh, that the law is intended and designed 
to treat everyone equally. Uh, and th w this has important ramifications. I mean, for example, there are lots of societies in which people want to, you know, the people in charge want to pass laws telling everybody else want to do, but they want to be exempted from those laws. They want to be free to do whatever they want, but they want other people to be under the control of the law. The, the, the rule of law properly understood says, no, 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 that, that, that's, that, you, might, you might legislate that, but it's not the rule of law as we have come to understand, it, in which law is a universal rule and everyone's uh, under, under the law, no exceptions. Uh, and if you want uh, to bring in a regime of law that says, well, certain people have privileges, but other people don't, uh, this, is not, this is not consistent with our tradition and our understanding of the rule of law. And it also means that the law is not applied uh, in inconsistent ways. You know, the, the, the reason that people got so upset, and I thought rightly upset, uh, about the issue, uh, you might recall, about uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould and whether there would be a special prosecution agreement with, uh, um, uh, with SNC-Lavalin uh, over their past behavior and so on. Um, I, I think the reason that people got quite uh, upset about what seemed to be in the minds of the government was that... Uh, the, the, this was this was beginning to look like a, what the French call a call a regime d'exception. You know, it's a, a regime of exceptions. That uh, well, there's one rule for most people, but when we feel it's to our advantage, we're going to uh, make special deals with people. Uh, and um, I, I think uh, what Jody Wilson-Raybould and her director of public prosecutions um, properly, you know, the principle they stood up for was that we don't let politicians decide who gets hauled up before the courts, for example. We don't let politicians decide uh, whether a prosecution is going to go ahead or not. Because uh, that's not a system in which everybody under the law is treated the same. Uh, and uh, I, I was quite proud of Canadians for the fuss they made over this. With the, you know, the prime minister standing up and saying, "Oh, you know, I'm I'm standing up for uh, for jobs," and and a lot of people saying, "Well, of course, feel free to stand up for jobs, but not at the expense of the rule of law, not uh, at the expense of you know you deciding whether or not." Uh, you, the Prime Minister, think somebody's uh, broken the law and whether you're going to let them off the hook, as opposed to judges deciding whether or not somebody's broken the law and whether they're going to be punished or not. Um, these are all essential pieces of the rule of law. Well, it seems like Prime Ministers, you know, right up to present day, uh, don't always live up to those ideals, uh, including um, Justin Trudeau. But I wanted to circle back to Sir John A. Macdonald because he's certainly been um, the sort of center of a lot of controversy, a lot of criticism, fierce criticism in recent years. Uh, some critics say that he should be forgotten. Others go much further. They call him a war criminal, accuse him of ethnic cleansing or even genocide. Um, some, some go so far as to say that, that what he did in Canada was the equivalent of a Holocaust. A uh, Cree leader and activist Harold Cardinal once said that it was the Canadian equivalent of Nazi Germany's final solution for the Jews of Europe. Now, this seems overly hyperbolic and sort of hard to even process for, I think, a lot of Canadians who are just patriotic, that, you know, they learned a little bit about Sir John A. in, in schools, but they're obviously not completely well-versed in, in all of the things that Sir John A. may or may not have done. So I, I wonder if you could help us sort of understand how uh, Canadians can understand these types of criticisms and, and what perhaps they can do to push back against some of these more radical narratives. Sure. Well, uh, look, I, I, as I've already said, um, I believe very strongly that uh, the place that is made in Canada for Aboriginal people is has traditionally been completely unacceptable. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, 
that's a that's a different issue from uh, the issue of Sir John A. Macdonald and his contribution to uh, the founding and the history of Canada. Uh, Sir John A., for example, I mean, you know, historical figures are complicated. They're not simple. Uh, they are not, uh, you know, evil caricatures. They are real complex people. So that, for example, um, you know, one of the criticisms that's made of Sir John is that uh, in a speech in Parliament, uh, if you take one sentence out of the speech, it's, it looks like he's saying, well, should we allow Aboriginal people on the prairies to starve? And they say, you see, he, he's, he's arguing for a policy of starvation of Aboriginal people. They don't go on and read the rest of the speech in which he says explicitly, we should reject such a policy. This is not acceptable. This is not how we behave. Uh, um, lots of people don't know that Sir John A. Macdonald granted the vote to Aboriginal people. Sir Wilfrid Laurier, his liberal successor, took it away again. Uh, uh, so these stories are always much more complicated than uh, the people who want to turn them into medieval morality play. Uh, uh, so, I, I, I've already talked about the, tr the, the political genius of Sir John A. Macdonald, which made the political order of Canada possible. Uh, uh, you know, people say he was uh, not only genocidal, I've, I've, I've dealt, I think, with that. Uh, they, they say, well, he was responsible for uh, residential schools. Well, <laughs> Every prime minister uh, up until uh, very recently uh, is in that sense responsible for residential schools because they all happened on their watch. He didn't start them. Uh, residential schools existed before uh, 1867. Uh, you know, he continued a policy which, by the way, at the time was regarded as enlightened. I mean, we don't see it that way now. Uh, they thought that this was a way of extending to Aboriginal people the benefits of, you know, Western uh, industrial society by uh, educating them uh, as, as we are uh, educated in our schools and uh, giving them the tools to be full participants in uh, Western society. Uh, we now understand that that's wrong and that, uh, you know, what uh, Aboriginal people should be doing is making uh, their own decisions about their own education in order to hand on their culture and their uh, their understandings to their children. And we should be completely supportive of that and making sure that they have the resources to provide public services to their communities the way that every other community in Canada has the resources to do that. Um, the fact that Sir John A., a complete child of his times, didn't see it that way, doesn't make him some evil devil to be extirpated from the history of Canada. Makes him a typical Canadian of uh, the latter half of the uh, 19th century. Um, and so I, I, while we want to be able to say, um, gosh, you know, in a way, we, we regret uh, the way that people in the past saw, let's say, Aboriginal people. And uh, uh, we recognize the damage that that did. We also see the, the good things they did, and we're able to balance them up and reach a just appreciation rather than a, a, either treating them as saints or devils, because they're neither, they're just human beings. Uh, and um, uh, we take our, our understandings from our longer historical perspective, looking back on what they achieved and what's happened subsequently, and we say, yeah, we, we want to do things differently. We don't, we're not required to despise our past because things, people did things differently, having different understandings at different times. Uh, we're required to take our understandings to today and do the very best we can to put them into effect. That's our job. Uh, and um, we don't have to hate the past in order to do that today.
Well, it seems like a lot of the people who are pushing the narrative and the idea that we should sort of start erasing our past, we should be ashamed, they're trying to strip context. Uh, they're trying to create, you know, one one dimensional caricatures of, of people to, to highlight only the bad parts of it. But s sometimes the efforts are, are, are done by people who, you know, don't seem to have those types of motivations. Um, Professor James Deshuck of the University of Regina has sort of been a leading, uh, I, I would call his basically a campaign of revisionist history. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I mean that in a, you know, a, a, a literal sense, he's trying to come up with a different narrative and, and history about Sir Johnny MacDonald and the history of, uh, you know, Canadian history, Western Canadian history had a book called Clearing the Plains, which, you know, paints out a lot of the accusations that you that you mentioned with the idea of uh, deliberate forced starvation and that kind of thing. I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with um, James Deshaq. What, what do you make of his his opinion? He's, he seems to be a very influential and even a celebrated historian in Canada. I know that he led a movement to have Sir Johnny Macdonald's name removed from a top book prize in Canada, the Canadian Historical Society Book Prize. So in 2018, they removed Sir Johnny Macdonald's name. And uh, according to uh, news reports at the time, members uh, of this historical society voted overwhelmingly in favor of the change. So obviously, that you know, there, 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 there's been some success in this campaign. Um, to change the way that we look at Sir John A. What, what do you make of the historians sort of moving this direction? Well, you know, uh, I, I think in the wake of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, that Canadians feel a, a, a great burden of responsibility for the fact that uh, through you know, uh, frequently indifference rather than hostility, uh, uh, we allowed uh, a, a situation to emerge in which uh, Indigenous people lived in scandalous circumstances in Canada. Uh, and I think there is a desire, a, a legitimate desire, a desire I share uh, on the part of many Canadians to make amends, uh, to do better. Um, I personally don't think that uh, making amends and doing better uh, is achieved by trashing the history of Canada. It's something that we have to learn from. And indeed, you know, if you, if you, if you take this, you know, the symbolism of tearing down statues or removing Sir Johnny's name from historical prizes or from schools or whatever. Um, you know, even uh, Murray Sinclair, now a senator, um, who chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he, he himself has, I, I think, uh, very heroically and properly said, you know, the issue is not tearing down uh, the statues, is not destroying the reputations of heroes who have contributed much to Canada. It's recognizing that our, our understanding of Canada and the narratives that we've had are, are partial. They don't cover everything. And that there are, for example, uh, Indigenous heroes uh, who've been left out of the narrative and who deserve their own uh, statues. And I say, bang on. Uh, you know, if there are, if there are people whose contribution to Canada has not been properly recognized. Uh, and we can celebrate them and their contribution to Canada. That's a positive step. Uh, saying, uh, oh, you know, there, Sir Johnny MacDonald uh, is responsible for everything bad that's happened ever since he was prime minister, and we should uh, be embarrassed ever to mention his name and, and extirpate him from the historical record. I think this is the wrong way to go about it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm kind of with uh, Murray Sinclair that um, our job is to do better at expanding the narrative of Canadian history, not narrowing it uh, and recognizing those things that have not been given their just due uh, yet. And I'm sure that there's much to be learned. I have much to learn. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm not going to stop defending Sir John A because I have lots to learn about other people who've contributed to Canadian history. Well, I, I know you've been in favor of um, 
reconciliation, you believe it's an important part of our, our tradition moving forward. But I, I want to get your thoughts on the Truth and Reconciliation Report, the commission report that came out in 2015. One of the things that I kind of got fixated on was their use of the term cultural genocide. I, I, I don't like that term because I, I don't think that the term I think the term genocide is created to have such a severe meaning that you shouldn't have a qualifier in front of it, that, that when you add the word cultural, it waters down and dilutes the meaning of the word genocide, which is reserved for the most egregious examples of atrocities in, in human uh, history, and there's only a small handful of them. Um, but, but, but perhaps that's just me with language. It, what, what, what did you make of the, the recommendations that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, gave, and do, do you think it was fair that they used that term cultural genocide? Well, you know, there's, there can be no doubt that what, what happened, you know, the, the, the residential schools and so on, we've, we've already talked about it a little bit. There was an effort to erase Aboriginal culture. I, I, I think no one can deny it. Um, and from our vantage point today, we know that that was a mistake, uh, that um, however well-intentioned the people who did it, um, uh, it's done terrific damage to, uh, to um, Indigenous people in Canada. We have a lot of work to do to, do to, to fix that. Um, I, I, you know, genocide, as you say, is a terribly freighted, uh, emotionally freighted word. Uh, and I, I really don't want to get hung up on whether we use, you know, word X or Y to describe uh, what was done in the past. I, I, I want us to fix our attention on where did we go wrong? How were we mistaken? How can we do better? How can we work together to fix this? Uh, and, you know, I, I, I don't think using words like cultural genocide are helpful. And I don't think um, resisting, uh, you know, fixing the mistakes uh, because we didn't like the word that was used is the right thing to do either. I, 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 I think uh, uh, you know, unless what we want to do is entrench beyond all fixing uh, a, uh, a, a culture of animosity and antagonism between Aboriginal and, or in, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Canada. Um, we have to stop using these words as clubs to beat each other. Uh, the important thing is that people of goodwill come together to try and make things better. And that's the only thing that matters. So what, what other steps can Canada take at this point? I, I, I'll just mention sort of anecdotally, I have some friends that live in New Zealand. And one of the things I always liked and kind of admired about New Zealand is how the, the mainstream New Zealand society promotes and sort of has pride around the Maori culture. They're very knowledgeable about them. And a lot of the sort of national symbols and, and art uh, have to do with the Maori people. And I, I, I grew up in Vancouver and in part on Vancouver Island. And, you know, there is a sort of very rich tradition of art. I notice your beautiful tie that you're wearing. I think that's Haida. Um, but my, my family loves Haida art as well and collects different kind of wooden pieces that we have around the house. Um, you know, that, that might be sort of a small token example of, of how Canadians can, can take steps towards reconciliation is, is by understanding the art and tradition and, and history of the, of the First Nations people. What, you know where we live, but what 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 do you think we can we can do at this point to to really try to um, achieve that vision that we talked about at the beginning of the interview of, of of making sure that all people have equal access to the sort of Canadian dream? Sure. Well, uh, um, my grandmother was New Zealander, and I, I completely agree with what you uh, say about um, the, uh, the the truly impressive way that people in New Zealand have. Uh, Aboriginal or Indigenous and non-Indigenous together have, um, have uh, integrated the contribution of uh, the Maori culture and people into the mainstream of, uh, of New Zealand life. Um, you know, here in Canada, um, 
there is, you know, look, let, 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 let's, let's be honest. There's, there's a lot of anti um, indigenous prejudice. Um, uh, and we have to work hard to overcome that without falling into the opposite uh, uh, error of thinking that uh, everything that uh, non-Indigenous people in Canada has been, uh, you know, a, a sin whose who's, uh, weight can never be lifted from our shoulders. Uh, I, I, I think the, the number one thing that we can and must do is to stop non-Indigenous people thinking that indigenous people are something that has to be fixed. You know, that, that, that somehow public policy is gonna swoop in and make everything better. Or that, uh, you know, if only we had, you know, got rid of the Indian Act, or we did this or that, that or the other thing. I, I, don't get me wrong, I'm fine with getting rid of the Indian Act. But uh, uh, that, that um, uh, uh, somehow th this paternalistic view persists that um, Aboriginal people are to be fixed because there's something wrong with them. Uh, they have, they bear the scars of our trying to fix them. Every generation thinks there's something different to be fixed. We got to stop thinking about them as something, as people needing to be fixed. They are people just like you and me. You and I don't want to be fixed by anybody else. We want to be able to live our own lives. Right, uh, and uh, Aboriginal people are no different. They want to be able to live their own lives. And in so doing, they need to get the same kind of support uh, from the rest of society that every, every one of us expects. So that, you know, they get the, right, the, the, the health services and the education services and all those other things. Um, uh, uh, delivered by the people who uh, who know them and understand them, i.e., by themselves, uh, rather than us swooping in and saying, "Well, you know, we've got the social workers and we've got the, you know, the healthcare workers and we've got the, you know, the, the we've got the the, the, the Aboriginal uh, department in Ottawa that's going to keep an eye on your local government to make sure you're doing X, Y, and Z." We, we we have to stop doing this. We have to uh, give them uh, the support that they need. We have to give them the opportunities that uh, are available to other Canadians. And then we have to let them make their own choices uh, with our complete support. Uh, I, I think we're not, I think we're not there yet. Uh, and um, I, the, the, you know, the, the government, um, uh, uh, of Canada is way too slow uh, in engaging with uh, with indigenous people to negotiate modern treaties and all it spend too much time in court not enough time uh, with practical problem solving uh, with figuring out how to make sure that we get out of the way of Aboriginal people and make sure that they have the resources to make lives for themselves in Canada that are worthy of uh, Canadian society and that reflect their values. That if, if we can do something even close to that, we will have uh, honored the obligations of our generation towards First Nations people. Well, that's very well said, Brian. Well, li like I said, this is a special Canada Day edition of the True North Speaker Series. And I think you really helped us sort of understand the, the areas of our, our history that we should be proud of and the areas that we still uh, of our society that we still need to, to work on. So just to sort of as a final message to viewers and to Canadians out there, Brian, you know, w w we, we want to be patriotic people. We want to have pride in our, in our country and our system. And, and of course, we have knowledge that our, uh, that our forefathers were not perfect and that they lived in a different time with sort of different cultural norms. So what, what message would you have to people, both those trying to kind of fight towards um, exposing the flaws of, of our, of our uh, past of past politicians and past, past leaders, but also those who just want to celebrate Canada, love Canada. What, what, what's the one sort of takeaway um, that we should have in trying to balance this, this idea of, of pride and patriotism with recognizing historical mistakes and injustices? Never forget that the way to judge any society 
any group of human beings is not against some impossible ideal standard. It's you must judge people against where they've come from, the efforts they've made to improve themselves, and what the alternatives are. By any of those measures, Canada is a rare jewel in human experience. We have every reason to be proud of Canada. Uh, we also have every reason to think that there are things that we can do better, uh, not in the superficial way of the, you know, the prime minister, you know, there, we can always do better. Uh, uh, better is always possible. Uh, but, you know, asking ourselves, where, where have we fallen down in, uh, in, in those things, those values that we believe in? Um, let's, let's, let's do what our forefathers did, which was try and solve the problems that seemed important to them at the time. We have problems that are important to us. We're going to work on solving them. It's the fact that we have problems and that we have never solved all our problems all at once and that we are not some ideal society of, of, of uh, angels and gods living on top of Olympus, but are real fallible human beings living in the real world. This is, this is not a reason to hang our head in shame, but rather to look around the world at other societies and say, compared to them, we've done a good job. We have more to do. Let's roll up our sleeves, be good Canadians, uh, be proud of what we've, we've accomplished, and let's, let's have this generation hand on to the next generation uh, achievements at, uh, uh, equal to the ones that we received from the preceding generations. Well, I, I really couldn't say it any better than that. So I think that's a great note to end on. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for joining the program. We really appreciate your time and your insight. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation.